I'd now like to call her back to the stage um, for our, our special interview um, and to learn a little bit more about her case and uh, what's happening in the Philippines as well across uh, the region. Maria, thank you so much for your inspiring words uh, earlier. You spoke about the fact that Amar Clooney is now representing you. So if you can just tell us a little bit more about your legal situation and where it stands. Uh, I have eight ongoing cases now. There are weeks where I will go to court four times on many different cases. I probably spend 70 to 80 percent of my time dealing with this, um, not, not including, you know, this is a war of attrition. It's a attrition of your attention, attrition of resources. Um, but I always have to give you the good side. Um, we were forced, as, because the, the cases began in January 2018, we were forced to pivot our business model by April of 2018 because our advertising revenue dropped 49%. You can't fight. The government has its resources and people are afraid. And so we were forced to find a sustainable business model using technology and data. We've found it. I think it kind of gave us a head start because the advertising model is kind of dead. <laughs> you, you, you spoke in your keynote, you said, why is questioning becoming criminal? What do you think it is about these regimes that they fear the pen, what, the work that you do? What is it uh, that they fear most? It's extreme arrogance and impunity. You know, it, and, I, and I'll go back to technology, and it was interesting to listen to your last panel, because that word prostitutes, you know, that started in the United States, spread to India, Pakistan, the Philippines. It was picked up by our propaganda machine, spread to South Africa. It was used to denigrate us. These attacks are systematic. They attack journalists. They attack institutions that, so that your credibility, that, so that you don't know what to believe. It's very Russian disinformation is that's the basis of it, right? If you don't know whom to believe and you don't know what to believe, then you can be reshaped. Your value system can be reshaped. I think that's what we're seeing. So this, the role of technology is huge in this. Um, and how do we fight it? We fight it as journalists, you know, investigative journalism that, frankly, is thinking slow, right? But social media is thinking fast. The manipulation are you know, lies wrapped in anger and hate, and they spread much faster. So we're really in an uphill battle right now, and we need the tech platforms' help because they've got to, they've got to become gatekeepers because the public sphere is diseased. It really is, and it works against journalists. And I think a point that was made in the earlier panel when the leader of the free world describes journalists as enemies of the people. I mean, we've got President Duterte describing jour journalists as spies and, and sons of bitches. And this kind of rhetoric has become the norm. It's the dictator's playbook. I'm, I'm sorry, you know, it's the same thing. When you, when you can astroturf, and I use this, that phrase in the same way that you did in the panel earlier, astroturf is uh, putting fake grass so that you can create this bandwagon effect and make people think that this is true when in reality, it isn't, but you've already been shaped, right? So that's part of it. That softens. It's like fertilizer for the, for the budding populist authoritarian leader to come in and then use the podium of power, use state resources to actually come and cement power. That's what we're seeing. And we need to actively fight it. We need to do more stories about it. It is. In our end, it was investigative journalism that gave us the data to be able to fight. It's, the reason I say it with certainty is I can show you the data. I can show you the social networks, just like we can look at Al Qaeda networks. You know, we, you can see it, and we can do this country to country and connect it to the global disinformation system. In the Philippines, we were able to look at our social media landscape and connect, see the connections to the alt right in Canada, the alt right in the U.S. And the IRA, the Internet Research Agency, the Russian disinformation, this is geopolitical power. And yes, it is paid. It's power meant to manipulate for more power. You have, as you say, uh, been in journalism for 
more a than long time. <laughs> three decades. You've also known President Duterte for almost three decades. I mean, the first time you interviewed him was in 1986. He's very much aware of your work and the kind of work that you actually highlighted the, uh, the issues that the country, his region, Davao, faced under him. Why do you think he's trying to make an example of you today? Violence and fear uh, is a tool in the toolbox of President Duterte because when you have this vile, the drug war, this very brutal drug war, and then when he runs after enemies, and you don't need the facts, right? He'll come out with a list, list, narco list, list of politicians who are involved in drugs, and then they wind up dying um, when uh, perceived enemies have cases against them. It's a, it stifles dissent. And again, is there that much to hide that you can't answer questions? that you are violating the Constitution, that this is blatant abuse of power. It's, you know, I, I think if you're not fighting for your democracy now, you must, because we will only get weaker with time. Uh, and so, yeah, President Duterte, I think I, it, when I interviewed him in October 2015, um, this is when he was getting ready to campaign, and I asked him, he, he, when we started, he said, you know, he reminded me of our last interview. And I was still with CNN when I did that. And it wasn't a flattering interview, but he can be charming. Authentic is the word that we always use. And he admitted to killing three people. I asked him the questions a journalist would ask. And I have to say he was refreshing because he just said what came to his mind. And that's the same thing that you're seeing now. So what are we but seeing? Is that, is that what... Um, draws people to leaders like him because they, Gosh. they, as you say, there's something refreshing about the fact that he will admit to certain things and when you question him, he does answer you in, in as much yeah, of the truth, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think this is a perfect storm, right? Because democracy hasn't, liberal democracy hasn't brought all of, the trickle-down effect hasn't trickled down enough. And you put that together with kind of the accelerant of technology with the 99%. We've been in the US, it started with the 99% a few years ago. And if you look at the push forward towards more authoritarian style populist leaders, I'd say it began really moving in 2014, India and Modi, Indonesia in 2014, Prabowo, the former son-in-law of President Suharto, almost won, right? He ran again this time um, in a, in a more complex world, we want the world to be simpler. And believing somebody who seems to be just like you, which is what the presidential spokesman will always say, like having a beer with him, you know? Um, there's part of us that want that. So I understand it, but what I don't understand is why people who are educated, who do better, business can be co-opted, right? Because you get deals easier. Corruption is more centralized. Um, why they stay quiet? When I was growing up in the U.S., when I, when I was growing up in the U.S. and I went back to the Philippines after 1986, the people power revolt. Our country created that term, people power. And I thought, um, how could a man like Ferdinand Marcos have been in power for 21 years? Isn't the society co-opted as well? Didn't we help that? And then my friend said, you know, it's because you don't live here. It's because you're elitist. And then I will say, well, yeah, OK, I'm an intellectual elitist, and I'm OK with that. I like to think. Why, why shouldn't we be thinking? Long answer to this place to the worst of human nature, in the same way that the violence post in World War II that led to that was also the worst of human nature. We're seeing resurgence of it, but this one is led by the internet. And we need to come out with a system of values. And it is a combination of pushing the social media platforms and tech people that, because they don't understand and they, they're going to be forced to understand. And then the medium term is media literacy. The long term is education. But we can't wait for the long term because if we do, I always say this in academic, when we're, when we're all talking about this and the academics will say, Yes, but we need to study this. I'm like, guys, please remember, 
I could be in jail by the time you like study this. So please act. Like, and this is where I think smaller, agile, large news groups, we need to actually keep experimenting because there is no solution. I've, we work with the social media platforms. They don't really know how to do it and their business imperatives don't lead, give them an easy path. I mean, over the last uh, 30 years, you've observed uh, the, the kind of journalism that the Philippines has done and the region. And we often talk about the pendulum shifting. I mean, you, you've, you've seen, uh, you talked about the people's power in 1986. I mean, where is the Philippines and the region today in terms of press freedom? I began my career as a journalist in 1986. How exhilarating is that, right? And then uh, I worked I, for a decade in Manila covering Southeast Asia, and I covered every single nation that moved from authoritarian one-man rule to democracy. And I would hate that at the tail end of my career, I would be covering the pendulum swinging back with a different trigger. Uh, I believe we're on the right side of history. We know what the values are. It's a tougher one. It requires that we believe in the goodness of people, right? And that we hold those who want to take advantage of that to account. That's why we became journalists in the first place. But when someone like you, with your experience and your platform, is intimidated and spending so much time trying to post bail, what hope is there, I mean, for the future of journalism? Which is why I'm not intimidated. You know, I've... I've I'll say this, what the heck, right? I mean, my family wants me to stay in the US. I'm a dual citizen. Um, I thought it was interesting, even on our panel in New York, the three I of imagine us, Duterte wants you to stay in the US as well. I think he likes a challenge. No, <laughs> um, no but the reason why I keep going back, number one, I have an amazing team. And the younger generation, we're building our next generation of reporters. They're extremely courageous. And, they don't even call it courage. I, it just is. This is now, it's like there's pollution in the air, and that's what they're breathing, and they're going at it. But the other side is threats alone shouldn't stop us. It needs to have a name. You act on it, here's the name, and we hold it to account. And whether we can hold these violations and abuses of power to account next year, or three years from now, or a decade from now, there will be names attached to these actions. We've seen this in history before, so I, I demand that in the Philippines. I'll say one last thing before I forget this one, which is in Pakistan. Push Facebook, because they really are doing something. Like in Pakistan, for example, the last takedown, they named the ISI. That's pretty incredible. In the Philippines, they've done three takedowns. And in the last takedown last March, they named the network uh, and they took down the personal account of the guy who was the social media campaign manager of President Duterte, right? Uh, I think we need to push, and we need to let the tech people understand what is exactly at stake. It is our lives on the line, but we don't really have a choice. I don't have a choice. <laughs> you talked uh, in your keynote about liberal international order and these institutions that were formed. But these are the institutions then that we're seeing these sorts Falter. of numbers. Yes. yes, you know, 80 journalists killed, 348 in prison. Because the world has already changed drastically and we are using old tools to deal with new problems. Again, you go back to thinking fast, thinking slowly. If you haven't read the book, you should. It's Because it's all of this stuff plays to the worst of us, the worst of humanity, right? When you hear President Duterte curse, he is sexist at best, misogynistic at worst. And what we're seeing, what I'm worried about, is that there's a whole new generation of young men and women who will, we are rolling back our values. This has an impact on our values. Um, so, and to hear Filipinos say, it's okay to kill. It's okay to kill, you see that on Facebook. But how much is real and how much is fake? We don't know that. And more people need to find the courage to speak. And the people who are privileged in each of our societies have far more, uh, uh, they should be speaking more. This is not the time to duck. I mean, Mohammed uh, said in his earlier speech that the hostility towards journalists should not become the norm, but it already has. It is. I mean, and because it's so easy, just like in, you know, in World War II, it was, 
um, now, instead of being a journalist, I've been a journalist my whole life, and I work so hard at doing a good job at it, but it doesn't matter. Because the propaganda machine exponentially says criminal. My government calls me a criminal. The, the spokesman for President Duterte says that, and I will challenge that. That's an abuse of power. But where do we go, right? Who do we go to for a sense of justice? That's why we were journalists in the first place. We look for a sense of justice. I don't have all the answers, but I think we need to come together and we need to truly, uh, this is why I'm in London, Canada and Britain coming together. Okay, guys, that's great because how many governments have been silent while all of this is happening? Um, so I'm hoping good things will come out of it. I know you could be cynical, but let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. <laughs> In, in fact, uh, as you say, uh, Rappler's going into partnership with the investigative journal now. Fun. <laughs> yes. And, and uh, you know, is that something that you feel uh, President Duterte will find even more irritating, that you're, you're uh, increasing your, your global reach? I think even as we are fighting a defensive battle, we need to continue building for the future. And that's really, my friends ask me, why am I optimistic? Because this time is really... Like, I think we can create amazing things. I wish my government would stop and let me create, right? But even if they don't, we will still create and we will partner. It is a global landscape. Here's the flip side of all of the disinformation networks on Facebook. Humanity has never been connected by one platform in the way we are today. So the negative part is prostitutes can travel like that to any country around the world. But the positive part is these vertical silos of nation states are effectively gone. If they can fix the algorithms, we can use this for good. I'm positive. So you're, so you're hopeful about the state of journalism, especially, especially investigative journalism? I think investigative journalism is more important now than ever because fear and then this kind of impunity is, is pushing forward. I, I call it this dictator's playbook. We see it. And you know the guys, they really like each other. I was there in APEC when Trump, Duterte, Putin, in ASEAN, they like each other. And I can only like, think about what they whisper about. You know, that pesky journalist. And they do, right? Remember Putin and Trump. So how do, what do we do? How do we react? Do we just like say, hey, this is horrible? We have to, here's the last part. How do you use technology to build communities? How do you use, this is this, the elevator pitch of Rappler in 2012 was, we build communities of action. And the journalism is what we feed our communities. I think that's a great problem and we can solve that problem. Maria Ressa, thank you so much. Thank you.